break. And how to share the gospel. How to share the gospel. Jesus' last command was go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And as you look around in this room, there's a lot of chairs that are empty, which means that many of us are not doing our jobs. It's easy to soak in the presence of God. It's easy to go to Bible study. I can be in a service every week if I wanted to, just soaking in the presence of God. But to evangelize, it's hard because you have to deal with people. How many like to deal with people? You have to go out of your way. You have to do something that your flesh does not normally want to do. But God has called us to share the gospel with people. Why? Because we're living in a world that is lost. Turn on the TV, look at the news. The sin that's going on is rampant. You know, and if we don't share the good news with people, they're going to die and end up in hell. That's not what I'm saying. That's what the Bible actually teaches. And if you believe the Bible is the actual word of God, it should motivate you to witness and to tell others about Christ. Paul said this, the love of Christ compels me. And it's unfortunately that in the body of Christ, many Christians are indifferent, which means that they're saved, but they can care less if anyone else gets saved or how that family is doing or how their friends are doing. They love to enjoy the presence of God, but they don't want others or they don't make an effort to share with others about the good news of Jesus Christ. And I would not call you my friend if I was lost. And I spend a lot of time with you. We hang out. We play basketball. We go out to eat. And you're a Christian. You never shared with me the most important thing in the whole world for me to be saved and spend eternity in heaven. I would not consider you my friend. Because you're holding from me the very thing that I need the most to be satisfied in this life. Salvation. That's the greatest gift that God could ever give any human being is salvation, the gift of eternal life. So if we keep that to ourselves and we don't share it with being disobedient to the word of God. This is the most uh, disobedient uh, command in the Bible. It's called the sin of omission. The sin of omission is doing something that you know you should do, but are not doing not only commission, you commit sins. You lie, you're not supposed to lie, you committed a lie. Omission is you know you're supposed to be witnessing. You know that you have a lot of friends and family members that are on their way to hell, but I'm not going to tell them unless they ask me. And many times they'll never ask you. You have to go out of your way if you believe. Now, this is the key. If you believe with all your heart the gospel is true and people are on their way to hell. If you don't believe that, you're not going to witness. You're not going to go out of your way. You're not going to pray for the lost. you got to believe and not hear in your heart that it captivates your heart, that you know that people are on their way to hell unless you share with them the good news. Now, this message is not so much for instruction, but more of a reminder. We're going to go through evangelism explosion. And like a preacher said, most Christians don't need to be instructed. They need to be reminded. Right? How many, for the last past weeks, how many messages have we applied in the past last week? There was a preacher one time who preached the same sermon for about a month or two, and the congregation got so mad and said, Pastor, you can preach about anything else, but please change the message. He said, when you apply this message, then I'll move on to the next message. Because hearing the word of God does not bring blessings. Doing the word of God is what brings blessings. Right? Knowing that you, you're supposed to exercise and go to the gym and walk and all that. Knowing all that does not do you any good unless you actually put it into practice. The same thing we're hearing sermons after sermons after sermons. If we don't put them into practice, it does not do me any good and anyone else any good. Blessed is he who does the word of God, not just hear the word of God. So when you're sharing your faith, you want to ask diagnostic questions, and that means you're trying to find out where the person is at. You're trying to find out their spiritual condition. And one of the, the first question is how have you come to a place in your spiritual life where you know for sure or certain that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? Do you know for sure that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven right now? That's the question you want to ask them. And you're trying to find out where they're at. And most people don't know for sure. They might be saying, I'm working on it. I hope I go to heaven. You know, maybe. 
I'm a good person. And they'll say all these things. But the key there is no for sure. And if they say, no, I don't know. Well, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The Christian is the only one that knows for sure that he's going to heaven. Now, how can he know for sure? Because when a person becomes a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of them and you know that something has changed. Something is different. Your desires change. God gives you his spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come so the Christian can know how to get to heaven. So the next thing you want to ask him, can I share with you how I know for sure that I'm going to heaven? And then you present the gospel to them. But let's just say they say, yeah, I'm going to heaven. If I were to die today, I'm sure I'm going to heaven. And most people think that they're going to heaven. So the next question is, Suppose that you were to die today and stand before God, and he were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? So if they say, yeah, I'm going to heaven, you know, I'm saved, I'm a Christian. What would Jesus say if you were to stand before him? And most people would say, I'm a good person. I help everybody. I never kill nobody. And they'll start saying, I, 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 everything that they've done, everything good that they've done. So they're depending upon themselves for salvation. They're trusting in themselves to get to heaven. And we're going to see that that does not work. The only thing that works is trusting in what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. So these are questions that you want to ask people when you're talking to them. Family members, friends. Now, you don't want to come out and say, you know, if you were to die today, will you go to heaven? You need to know how to have transitional sentences. So you don't want to sound morbid and start talking to somebody about death. But use the news and everything that's going on in the world. You can turn on the news after you go home and find out somebody died or there was a shooting somewhere. Is that true? Right? And you can tell them, look, these things are terrible what's happening in the news. Have you heard? These people got killed or this happened. All these different things. That's crazy, right? Now, let me ask you a question. How about you? If anything were to happen to you, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? Learn how to transition into the gospel intentionally. People are not going to ask you about your faith most of the time. Sometimes they will. But if you're waiting for them to see the light in your eyes, it may never happen. If the apostles stood in the upper room speaking in tongues and never went out to actual witness, we would not have a church right now because they decided to just soak in the presence of God. So these are the questions you want to ask. Learn how to transition from the natural into the spiritual. By asking questions, by using current events, and tie that in to ask this question. If you were to die today, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? And then the conversation should lead from there. You should share the gospel with them. And if they say, yes, I would like to know for sure that I'm going to heaven. That's when you begin to preach the gospel. So the first point of the gospel is about people. People are sinners, and they can't save themselves. People are sinners. And they can't save themselves. Now, us as believers, we know that again in our minds, but we need to know that in our hearts. There's no such thing as a good person according to Jesus. Jesus said this, no one is good but God alone. Now, some people can do good deeds, right? Help somebody here, give money to this person. Those are good deeds. But deep inside, there's no such thing as a good person in the eyes of God. Why? Because God defines goodness based on his holiness, based on his character, based on his, who he is. So God uh, defines holiness and goodness based upon his person. So compare to God. Who can raise their hand and say, I'm good? Nobody can. There's no one good, only God alone. Now, Romans chapter 3, verse 9 through 18, I'm going to read it to you. And this is a description of humanity. And those of us who are studying Romans on Tuesday, we went through this passage. This is how God sees the world. Not how you see your grandmother or your uncle or your brother. This is how God sees the world. Because if we're going to be truly sharing our faith, we need to have divine spectacles and see things the way God sees them. This is how God sees everybody in the world without Christ. Paul says, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Talking about Jews and non-Jews. Not at all. We, all have, we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike 
or all under sin. Everyone is under sin. Everyone is under the power of the control of sin. Have you ever said, I need to stop doing this sin, and you try to stop, and you can't stop it? That's the power of sin. And then in verse 10, it says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. Now, that has to do with the intellect. Sin affects even your own intellect. It impairs you to make terrible decisions. No one seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throat are open graves. Now he begins to describe how sin affects every member of our body. The throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they practice deceit or lying. The poison of vipers are on their lips. Their mouths are full of what? Cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And that's the life of the unbeliever who does not know Christ. Ruin and misery. We could all have family members that we can look at right now. And what's ruining their life and what's making them miserable is the sin in their life. They try this. They try that. This program. Ruin and misery is the result of sin. The problem with the human race is sin dwelling in their hearts. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, or the Bible says in the Old Testament, it says to the, those who know the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. So this is just proving to you that every single person is a sinner, regardless of how nice they look on the outside, what kind of car they're driving, you know, what kind of house they own, what kind of job they have. Inside, every human being is corrupted by sin. They lie, they cheat, they steal, they deceive, they, they'll curse if they have to curse somebody out. All that dwells inside the human heart. So everyone is born a sinner. King David says, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now, he's not talking about his mother committed fornication or adultery, and that's how he was born. He's talking about that he was born a sinner. He was born in sin. Everyone is born a sinner. There's no such thing as a, a baby being born, and that baby is excluded from being a sinner. Everyone is born a sinner because what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, they disobeyed God. We inherited a sinful, depraved, and corrupt nature. And all of us who've lived long enough know how that corrupt nature works. It's depraved. It wants to get over. It's selfish. It only thinks about itself. How can I benefit me? Me, myself, and I. We want to be our own gods. We want to make a call our own shots. We don't want God in our lives. That's the depraved nature. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, it says, There is not one person on earth who always does what is right and never sins. So if you meet somebody and they tell you, I've never sinned in my life, I'm a good person, you're looking at the biggest liar you have ever met. Because everyone has sinned. Everyone has broken God's commandment. Everyone is born with that rebellious nature. That's why you tell somebody, don't do this. And the first thing that rises up inside of them is to do the opposite. Why? That sinful and corrupt and depraved generation. So everybody's a sinner. And you have to share that with them as you share the faith. You got to let them know that they're born sinners. Because if you present the good news without presenting the bad news, it's not going to make sense. You don't need a savior if you don't see yourself as a sinner. If you go to the doctor and he starts, as soon as you see him, he starts giving you this prescription. He says, go take these and you'll feel better. Your question should be, wait a minute, I didn't even get, to get a diagnosis. You didn't even check me out. You're giving me pills. He's not going to appreciate that. But if the doctor gives him a diagnosis, says, look, you're in terrible condition, and you got to take these pills three times a day, and this, then this will help you. Then he'll appreciate that medication. He'll appreciate those pills. Why? Because he knows there's certain wrong with them. So the first thing as you're witnessing, show people in love that they're born in sin. And people will always try to justify themselves. Because there's always somebody doing worse than we're doing, right? 
We could always find a drug addict, an alcoholic, and look at them and say, well, at least I'm not doing that. I'm not like that person. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't steal. You know, everybody tries to justify themselves. But standing before God in the day of judgment, every mouth will be stopped and closed in the eyes of God. Unless you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And then you want to talk to him about God. God is merciful, therefore does not want to punish sin. Everybody loves to talk about the love of God, the mercy of God. Right? The grace of God. God is love. First John chapter 4, verse 8. Because God is love, it says. But, and then is he, uh, Exodus 34, 6. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. This is who God is. He's a God of love, a God of compassion, uh, abiding in faithfulness always. But the second a part of, the, of, of God's character is that God is just. Therefore, he must punish sin. So it's two sides of the same coin. One side is the love of God, and the other side of that coin is the justice of God. And that he must punish sin because he can't let sin slide or, or, or look over and say, look, it doesn't matter. God is just. God is holy. He has to punish sin. Exodus chapter 34, verse 7 says, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. That's the price for sin, death. Someone has to die for, for their own sins, and we're going to see how God sends Jesus to die for our sins. But the wages of sin is death. Somebody has to die. You either die for your own sins and spend eternity in hell, or you receive the substitute death of Christ and allow him to forgive you for your sins and go to heaven. First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine and 10. God is the God of love, but he's also God of justice. Do you not know that the wicked were not inherit the kingdom of God? In other words, they're not going to go to heaven. The wicked are not going to go to heaven. Not everyone goes to heaven. And you, sometimes you go to a funeral and, oh, he was a good guy or a good girl. He's in heaven right now with the Lord. And deep, a lot of us know they're not in heaven. They were the most wicked person that lived on the earth. People say that try to comfort themselves, but if they live a sinful lifestyle and they not receive Christ into their life, they're spending eternity in hell. Look at what Jesus said. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Everyone you know died in those two conditions, saved or condemned. There's no in between. There's no limbo. There's no purgatory. Saved or condemned. If they die saved, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. If they die condemned with sin in their lives, without repenting, without turning to God, as soon as they come out of their body, demons there drag them straight to hell. That is the gospel that we're supposed to be preaching. We become so refined and so politically correct, and we don't want to offend anybody. Yeah, all these other organizations are offending everybody. They, don't, they run over through everybody. But us as Christians... We're just sitting back being passive. And maybe if they ask me, you know, I don't know if that's my calling and all these different excuses. There's no calling for you to witness. There's no calling for you to share your faith. That's everybody's job. Wherever you work at, that is your calling to share your faith. So if you work in the medical field, medical field, the nurses, the doctors, they need to hear about Christ. If you're working on the political field, they need to hear the gospel of Christ. Wherever you work at in that field, you are the missionary in that place. You're not there just to make money. You're there to share with people that are struggling in their marriages. You're there to share with parents that have kids on drugs and let them know the answer is Jesus Christ. You're there for a reason. It's never about the money when it comes to God. God can provide for you any way he wants. The reason you're there is for a divine purpose. There's people there that need to hear the gospel. And if you share the gospel and they don't receive it, you move on. But you did your part. God never calls us to save people. He calls us to tell them the good news. Do not be deceived. Still talking 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Do not be deceived, which means people can be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, no idolaters, no adulterers, no male prostitutes, no homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, 
No slanderers, no swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, these people, if they stay in that condition without turning to God, and God can change anybody, because even here in the church of current, God changed a lot of people that were involved in homosexuality and lesbianism and drunkenness and, and parties and all these different things. God saved them and sanctified them. But here Paul is saying, don't be deceived. Don't get it wrong. God is a good God, but if you don't repent, these people are not going to go into heaven. It's unfortunate that there's millions of Christians right now, or so-called Christians, deceived, going to gain churches. So when Jesus comes back, that church is going to remain, and they're dragging everybody to hell. The Holy Spirit is not there. That's like having a lying church, and everybody lies. There's no repentance. That's just the way God made us. We lie to everybody. When Jesus comes back, the lying church will stay here lying to each other. Do not be deceived, which means a person can be deceived and twist the scriptures and think God is going to let me slide with my sin because he's a good God. God is a holy God. And that's one of the things we've lost in the body of Christ, the fear of God, the holiness of God. The character of God. Sometimes we think God is like us. He's nothing like us. He can relate to us, but he's nothing like us. That's why holy means that he's separated. He's transcended. He's separated from sin and evil and all corruption. He lives in a cloud by himself. For all eternity. That's the holiness of God. And until we don't see the holiness of God in our own lives, we'll, we'll take sin lightly. And then we'll take it lightly with other people. It's no big deal. Everybody sins. You know, in that book that I mentioned by this psychiatrist who wrote it, whatever, whatever became of sin. And he's talking about dealing with patients there. He wasn't even a Christian, but at that time in the 70s, there's a lot of preaching on sin and repentance, and you need to turn to God. So he has some sense to say, wait a minute, I can't help him with my psychiatrist and, 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 my, and my theories and all of that. Whatever happened with sin? And he begins to list all the blame. Who's the blame for not preaching on sin anymore? He blames the churches. He blames the pastors. He blames the counselors for not teaching on sin anymore. He said, look, what people do, instead of calling it sin, we call it a crime, right? What's the crime rate? A better thing is to say, what is the sin rate in that town? Because when you talk about sin, it makes people accountable to God. Now sin, they fluff it up with a problem. I got an issue. I have an addiction. You know, all these different names. But the reality is you are a sinner in need of grace. And as long as we keep patching it up with all these fancy names, people will not feel accountable to God. But when you talk to people and tell them you have sinned against God, lying is a sin against God, stealing is a sin against God, adultery is a sin against God, drunkenness is a sin against God. Even if no one ever catches you, God sees everything is a sin against God. Make people aware that they've sinned against a holy God. Yes, he's love. And you talk to a lot of people and they'll ask you, isn't God loving? I don't see how a loving God can send anybody to hell. Right? They'll mention that. They will want to lean upon the love of God. But you have to say, yes, if God is loving and God is good, he will see that evil will be punished. Because if not, he will not be a good God. If not, he'll be a pushover. People see God as a Santa Claus. that He wants to give you all these gifts so that you can live nice in this life and that's it. God is a holy God. God is pure. And in the Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and 21, again, Paul is listing all these sins, talking to Christians. So Christians are not deceived or Christians are not, uh, don't get it twisted in their mind that they think they can go to heaven with these actions. Galatians 5, 19, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, you can throw pornography in there. Impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. You know that hatred is a sin? A person can live a nice, clean life outside, have a good car, have a good job, and all that. And if they have hatred in their heart, God equates that with murder. Because in 1 John, it says, He who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life living in him. Because in your heart, when you hate somebody, you wish they were dead. 
talking about that kind of hatred. Most people don't kill people is because they don't want to suffer the consequences. They don't want to go to jail. But let's just say, look, for one day, we're not going to arrest anybody. You can commit any crime you want, and we're going to let you slide. You know how many people will be dead that one day? So God sees beyond the action. He sees the sin of the heart. Hatred, he mentions here. Discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. And this is a sin that us Christians can struggle with. Selfish ambition. How does it benefit me? Does it get me out of my comfort zone? I don't want to do that. I don't feel like doing that. I want to do what God wants me to do, but it has to be my way. Selfish ambition. People want to do things their way. Stubborn. Dissensions. Factions. And envy. Drunkenness. Orgies. And the like. I warn you, as I did before, listen to this, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. People who live like this are not going to heaven unless they receive Christ into their life. Unless they repent of their sins. Unless they turn to God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then what did God do? We saw that God is love, but God is just, he has to punish sin. And that's when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. Jesus took our sins upon himself. So that we can have life. So God is love, but God is just. But he has to punish sin because that's the justice of God. Sin has to be punished. Sin, uh, somebody has to die for sin. And in the Old Testament, it was animal sacrifices. You offer an animal sacrifice, the animal dies, and you were atoned for. Now you can go home because someone spilled blood on their behalf. But that was not good enough. It had to be a human being that died for another human. And that was Christ Jesus who came in the flesh. Who was he? He's the infinite God-man. The infinite God-man. It says in John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, In the beginning was the Word, talking about Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then in John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word, talking about Jesus, became flesh or became human and lived among us. This is the Apostle John talking. We have seen his glory, the glory of the only one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So Jesus is the Son of God. The greatest event that has happened in human history is God in the flesh landed on planet Earth 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem through a Virgin Mary. That's the greatest event that has changed human history. More books have, written, have been written about Christ than any other person in the entire world. Because he is the son of God. Look at what it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. We know also that the son of God has come and has given us understanding. So that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Jesus Christ is the true God manifested in the flesh. And we need to have what theologians call a, a, a proper Christology, which means a proper view of who Christ is. Don't feel sorry that they crucified Christ 2,000 years ago. See him as the son of the living God, that one day he's coming back for his church to bring judgment upon the earth for all the wickedness that exists upon the earth. The greatest event that occurred was the Son of God landed on this planet and walked on the earth for three and a half years with his disciples and taught them the way of salvation, cast out many demons, healed the sick, performed miracles, did all these wonders because why? God so loved us so much that he sent his son to die in our place. So that's who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. God manifested in the flesh. So what did he do? He died on the cross and rose from the dead to pay the penalty for our sins and purchase a place in heaven for us. So what did Christ do when he came on the earth? He died for us. There was a, a divine transaction that took place. He took our sins upon himself and we take upon his righteousness. It was a transaction. It's not following a religion. 
It's not joining a church or writing your name in the roster and say, I'm a member of this church. It's you repenting of your sins and turning to God. So when you're witnessing to people, you have to take them through this process and let them know that, yes, they're sinners and they stand before God guilty. But God is love. But God, God is also just. He's going to judge your sin. But you know what God did so that you don't have to go to hell? You start talking to him about Jesus Christ, what Christ accomplished on that cross. He paid the penalty for our sins so that we don't have to go to hell and we can go to heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, it says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Christ did not die for his sins. He didn't do anything wrong. He lived a perfect life. And sometimes that's impossible for us to think about. But he never lied. He never stole it. He never saw anybody with lust. He never did anything. He never sinned his entire life here on this earth. For 33 years and a half, not one sin he committed. Because he was the perfect son of God. So he didn't die for his sin. And when you're talking to people, explain to them. That he died for their sins. Make it personal. That they have sinned. And if they don't repent and turn to God. They're going to end up in hell. But they don't have to go there. The good news is. That Jesus died for your sins. Jesus paid the price. 2 Corinthians 5.21. And these are just scriptures showing you. The purpose of Jesus being born of Virgin Mary. And walking the earth for three years and a half. What was his mission? To die for the sins of the world. Because he loves the people of the world so much. That he wants people to be saved. He wants people to turn from their wicked ways. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For God made Christ. Who never sinned. To be the offering for our sin. So that we could be made right with God through Christ. There's only one way a person can be made right with God. And that is through Christ. Only through Jesus. There's no other way. All these different religions. There's no other way. Why? That's called the exclusivity of Christ. Because Christ is the only one that paid the price for our sins. Buddha didn't pay the price for our sins. Muhammad didn't pay the price for our sins. Only Christ took our sins upon himself. And he lived a sinless life. The only way a person can get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's exclusive. Only through Christ. People want to make other ways to get to heaven. All religions lead to God and all that. In the, in, in, all religions fundamentally appear to say the same thing. But when you study them... They're in opposite direction. Jesus said, I am the way to get to heaven. Muhammad says, no, the Quran and, and the holy war is the way to get to heaven and all that. That's a contradiction. They both can't be right. Somebody's wrong. But don't tell me all religions get to heaven. Somebody, they, and they all contradict each other. Somebody's wrong. And it's not the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 1 verse 4. Again, these scriptures Jesus gave his life for our sins. And if you have a Bible, always underline ours. Because it had nothing to do with his sin. It had nothing to do with he did anything wrong. He came for that very purpose. The Romans did not crucify him. The Jews did not crucify him. We crucified him. Listen to what he says. I, lay, I have power to lay my life down and I have power to lay it up again. No one takes my life from me. It wasn't the Jews. It wasn't the Romans. He allowed them. But the main thing that put them on the cross was our sins. Lying, stealing, deceiving, lusting, all these different sins. That's what put them on the cross. Not the Jews or the Romans. Those are just the instruments that God used. But he came to die for the sins of the world with a purpose. It wasn't like he was the son of God and, and he, some misfortune happened to him and they grabbed him and poor Jesus. Look, they crucified him. Oh, my goodness, what's going to happen to him and all that? That's not what happened. His purpose, his purpose to be born was to die for our sins. He gave his life for our sins just as God our Father planned 
in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. So you talk to them about the sin in their life and the character of God. Yes, he's a God of love, but also a God of justice and sin has to be punished. But Jesus, a uh, God answered that problem through sending his son Jesus to die for your sins. So the, the problem with death has already been dealt with for those who receive Christ into their life because somebody already died in your place. But how do you receive it? By grace. Heaven is a free gift. It is not earned or deserved. And that's important because a lot of people think that they can earn their way to heaven. If I'm a good person or God calls me and puts a scale and my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I'm in. Then that means that you work your way into heaven. You earn your way into heaven. That means you can brag in heaven and say, I got in because I was good. I was better than everybody else. The Bible says it's a free gift. It cannot be earned or deserved. The scriptures, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. What are wages? Something that you get paid. So if you keep working with sin, you keep working sin in your life, there's only one price. You're going to get a big paycheck at the end of your life, and that's death. The wages of sin is death. It's pleasurable, but it pays horribly. Is eternity separated from God in hell. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift of God. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to clean your life up. Some people say, well, if I, if once I stop drinking or if I stop cursing, then I'm going to come to God. You can't clean your life up. You need to come to God just the way you are. And as you witness to people, they feel that way. Tell them that it's a free gift. They can't work for it. They're not going to deserve it ever. God has given it to us as a free gift if we repent for, from our sins. Titus chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. It says, but when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done. In other words, we're not good enough to get to heaven, but Christ is good enough. And that's why he died in our place. And if we receive Christ, that's our ticket to heaven. But because of his mercy, he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, God saved us and called us to live a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So we're saved by grace, which means undeserved favor. We didn't deserve for God to save us. We didn't deserve to be forgiven of sin. God gives it to us by grace for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation is the gift of God for every human being that receives it. Not by works so that no one can brag. There's nothing that you can do to earn your way to heaven and say, look, I'm a good person. I help so many amount of people. I'm going into heaven. Not by works is by grace. And then the last part, through faith. By grace, through faith. In other words, there's something that you have to do. Christ died already for the sins of the world. But it doesn't help anybody unless they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Just like exercising will benefit the whole world, but they have to join the gym. They have to make a commitment. The same thing. Jesus died for the sins of the world. But unless they repent and turn to God, it's not going to do them any good. So through faith, what is it not? It is not mere intellectual assent, which means people agree with Jesus intellectually. They believe that there was a man named Jesus, and that's all it is. Just like I believe in George Washington. I believe in Alexander the Great, but am I putting my trust in George Washington or Alexander the Great to do something for me? Absolutely not. So when people say, I believe in Jesus, that's what they're referring to. They have intellectual agreement that he lived, that he was a, a, the son of God and a good person, but that's all it is. It is not mere temporal faith. There's people that believe God for a certain period of time. In other words, I was believing God for this job and I got the job. You talk to sinners and they tell you, no, God got me through a difficult time. I was sick and I got healed. I didn't die of COVID. I trust God. But it was only for that moment. And you see after that, they're living a sinful lifestyle. 
So that's they put their faith in God temporarily. It's not saving faith. So what is faith? Trusting in Jesus alone for eternal life. Trusting in Jesus alone is not faith plus works. Is not Jesus plus my good works, me giving money to the church, me attending church. All these, those things are good, but they don't save. Those are the fruit of salvation, not the root of salvation. It's believing in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, trusting in him. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Remember, that word believe means to commit your life to him or trust him for your salvation, that he paid the price for your sins. You make a commitment to Christ. And then John chapter 3, verse 15 and 16 says this. Everyone who believes in Christ may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That word perish means to be uh, destroyed or doomed forever, to be lost in all eternity. So here John says, look, whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have the gift of eternal life. Everyone you know either died in sin or died in Christ. John chapter 3 verse 36 says this. Whoever believes in the son. Has eternal life. But whoever rejects the son. Will not see life. For God's wrath remains on him. Two types of people. Those who receive Christ. And those who reject Christ. A lot of young people. I want to have fun. I want to party. I want to do this and that. Maybe when I'm older. Then I'll give my life to Christ. You don't know how many young people. When I grew up with. Had that same mentality. And all of them died in a shootout. You know in the block. It was very hot. You know they sold drugs and all that. So a lot of those young people. That I grew up with. Died in their sin. Because they thought that they can live forever. When you're young. You feel like invincible. I have all these years. Look tomorrow is not promised to any of us. I may not wake up tomorrow if it's God's will. It's not promised to any of us. So the smartest thing any person can do is grab a hold of Jesus Christ and begin to walk with him and allow him to change your life and allow him to fulfill his calling and his purpose in your life. You will never regret giving your life to Christ. You will be the most satisfied person, the most fulfilled person in the world. And like I said last week, the will of God will not make you miserable. A lot of the biggest lie the devil throws people is that if you serve God, you're going to be miserable. And a lot of times we've seen older folks serving God, and they're the most bitter, critical. They can't stand anybody. They're judgmental when people walk into church. You know, and sometimes, you know, people come in and say, man, if I get saved, I'm going to be like that. I'd rather not. Right? Because, you know, as you grow with the Lord, you should be more loving, more caring, more compassionate. Because God has dealt with you for all these years. So he's the son of God. And in conclusion, after you witness to them, you want to ask them, does this make sense to you? Now, this is a conversation that you're having. You're not preaching to them. You're conversating with them. You're sharing the gospel. You tied in worldly events. So you can ask your question. You ask your question. And if they want to know more, then you share the gospel with them. And after you share the gospel with them, you want to know if that makes sense to them. And if it doesn't make sense, then you might have to explain one of these points. Man, God, Jesus, grace, or faith. Does this make sense to you? And if it does, then you move on. And then you ask them, what hinders you from receiving the gift of eternal life right now? What stops you from receiving eternal life right now? What stops you from receiving Christ into your life right now? And if they say nothing... Then you lead them in a prayer and say, you need to ask God to forgive you for your sins right now. But if they say, well, I got to clean up my life first, then you got to backtrack. You want to know what is it that's hindering them from receiving Christ? And if they say nothing, praise God. But if they say yes, you want to know what that is so that you could address that issue. I'm not ready and uh, I'll think about it. And that's fine. You never want to force anybody to receive Christ because if you do, it will turn out to be a false conversion. Like we've seen many Coming to this church came up because they saw something. They got touched that moment. But after that, they went back and, and didn't read the Bible. They didn't pray. They didn't connect with the body of Christ. Nothing really happened in their life. They just made a decision but never made a commitment in their life to follow Christ. So you want to make sure that it makes sense to them. And you want to make sure that they understand the gospel. You're not selling a cheap gospel. 
We're not trying to get people to come to church so that we can say we have this amount of people in the church. You're trying to share with them eternal life. You're trying to snatch them out of the gates of hell and bring them into the kingdom of God. That is our duty. That is our job. And if God will lead you to lead that person to Christ, lead that person to Christ, whether in a coffee shop, whether, you know, driving, you know, I drive a bus, you know, whether wherever you're at, in a supermarket, you might see people you haven't seen in a long time. You start talking to them. And then a lot of people are panic and nervous about what's going on in the world. A great thing to a transition is, let me ask you a question. If you were to die, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? Most people in the world are paranoid. They don't know what's going to happen. They, they, you don't know how many people are anxiety pills and depression and all these different things. And we have the answer to share with them so that they can be set free. So why don't we stand as we get ready to close? So there's how to share the gospel. And the, the calling is, well, the commitment for this, this week is share the gospel this week. Put this into practice because if not, it's not going to do you any good. This week I was in the gym and I saw a guy who used to go to the other gym and I started talking to him. And, and you know, we started, of course, talking about the things of God. I always transition to the things of God. Always. Because listen, church, that is the most important thing in the world. But you have to believe that. And if you're not doing it, you don't really believe it. You can teach it, but you don't believe it. I talk to him and, and, you know, share here and there. I said, I'll be here. I come at this time and all that. So planted the seed. You know, I talked to this other person this week, and I told him, because I already told him before, I said, look, you would never, and I emphasize, you would never be happy unless you receive Christ into your life. I truly believe that. Do you believe that? They'd never be happy. And I've witnessed this person before, but I keep kind of reiterating. They want a different answer. You would never be happy unless you receive Christ into your life because your problem is sin. You're separated from God. That's the problem. It's not this person or that person or what car I drive or this or that. Sin is the problem. So the commitment for today is make a decision to share Christ with somebody this week. This week, practice what you've learned. Put it into practice. Call a cousin, a nephew, a niece, an aunt, or uncle, somebody. Practice with them. Talk to them and then transition into the gospel. Now, they might not get saved, but at least you shared the gospel. You're doing your part. So the question this morning to some of you is, if you were to die today, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? And if you don't know for sure, you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. By receiving Christ into your life. So if that's you, I want you to come up and, and we'll pray together so you can receive Christ into your life. So you can know for sure. You got to know definitely that you're going to heaven. You don't want to hope. You don't want to maybe. Uh, all these different things. You want to know for sure. So let's just pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the gospel, oh God. Lord, that saved me, oh God, 30 years ago, Lord. God has never has lost, oh God, his freshness, oh God, his, his power, oh God, Lord, as we're studying Romans, that Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God to save those who believe God, that we will be people of the gospel of your son, oh God, that we will never be ashamed, oh God, of the gospel, oh God, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, but that that gospel, oh God, will continue to captivate our hearts, oh God, and our minds, oh God, that we will be like Paul, oh God, who said, the love of Christ compels me, Lord God, that we will be compelled by your love, oh God, that we will not be indifferent towards the lost, oh God, that we will not lack love, oh God, Lord, Father, that we will not see unbelievers, oh God, as enemies, oh God, Father, help us, oh God, to see, oh God, them as you see them, oh God, Lord, give us a burden for the lost, oh God, that we will not go about our business, oh God, just studying the Bible for ourselves, Praying for ourselves, oh God. Going to Bible study for ourselves, oh God. Soaking in your presence for ourselves, oh God, Lord. That as we freely receive, oh God, that we will freely give out the living water to this dying and thirsty world, Lord. In the name of Jesus. God, that we will not be complacent, oh God, Lord. That you would fill, oh God. Your church, oh God, with new believers, oh God, because your people, oh God, are about our Father's business. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
And this week, church, I just encourage you so you can have a change of heart, getting this in the spirit now and even when I was praying earlier. Just pray for the lost this whole week. Focus on the loss. I know we have our own issues and problems that we want God to take care of. If you take care of God's business, and I can't thrust this you know, deep into your heart, but if you take care of God's business, what is in God's heart, he'll take care of you. For the whole week, think about it. If all of us the whole week are praying for the loss, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, the whole week, not for me, Lord God, help them that they'll repent, touch them, open their heart the whole week, bombarding heaven, crying out, God, save our family members and friends. You don't think that all of us in one accord will move the heart of God? Instead of me praying because I have a stomach ache. But sometimes we pray, and if I ask people, what do you pray yesterday or last? They don't remember. They don't jot down what they prayed for. They just shoot up prayers all crazy. God only answers objective prayer. They have an object. Lord, do this. Specific prayers. General prayers, God don't answer. Only specific prayers. Write down a list like we did with the prayer and fasting. We prayed for 21 days. There was a list. There was focus. You pray for a topic every single day. You were structured. This whole week, write down everyone who you're going to pray for. And you believe in God to save. And all of us together, storming the gates of hell, doing warfare. And telling the devil, turn that person loose right now in Jesus' name. God will begin to move. We'll see people getting saved more and more. And I reached out to my brother-in-law yesterday, ministering to him, went to visit him a little bit. He, you know, he was sleeping, but then he talked on the phone about the message last week about pride and, and, and redemption. He said, man, that's me, man. Call people. Don't get caught up with just believers, believers, believers. There's people out there that are lost, that people have forgotten about them, right? Because they're a drug addict. They're an alcoholic. That's just the way they want to be. Give them that phone call and say, can we meet? What, what troubles your soul? Let me pray for you. Love people and God will use you. We're going to end with that. But this week, don't lift up any prayer for yourself, please. Do it for God's sake. Just everything for the loss, the loss, the loss, the loss. And you're going to see what we're worrying about. God will take care of it. God bless, church. Amen. And if you want to receive prayer, you can come up. If you want to receive the Lord into your life, and get committed to him, you can come up at this time.